Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Clear Motive Marketing. I co-founded this high-impact creative agency over 15 years ago. We deliver marketing that matters to our clients through our three-pillar approach. Number one, research that delivers actionable insights. Two, creative that attracts and engages new customers. And three, which is the backbone of our client's success, the people, process, and technology that ensure efficient, consistent, high-quality results. We have great ideas and incredible creative, which is expected from a national agency. What makes us different is that we also simplify workflow, use technology to speed up projects, and recommend activities that achieve higher returns. There is a mountain of work that happens behind the scenes to produce what our clients take for granted, and that's exactly how we want it. Because great creative combined with well-organized operations is why we have such long-standing relationships. For example, Honda Canada has renewed their contract with us annually for the last 12 years. Our clients are market leaders, so they're incredibly competitive. Efficiency, performance, and consistent results are the only way to get to the top and to stay there. If you're not getting the consistent results you need, I can help. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or check out clearmotive.ca. Hello and a warm collisions. Why I see welcome to my guest this morning, Mr. Nathan Pichet. How are you doing, Nathan? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. You're calling in. Uh, we're doing the mandatory Canadian. You're calling in from Ottawa. We're minus 30. You're not at minus 30. I'm a bit envious of your weather. <laughs> <laughs> the mandatory Canadian uh, weather chat. But I appreciate you calling in, uh, jumping on the show this morning, coming in from Ottawa. I got connected through one of your team. You are a lawyer and trademark agent at Gowlings. So far from me to assume what a lawyer and a trademark agent might do at Gowlings. Why don't you give us a little bit of uh, a window uh, in the, inside the elevator here? And uh, what do you do? What keeps you busy? And uh, let's launch off on a topic that I think has is rife for misconception. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'd say broadly speaking, I help clients protect their brands. So my work uh, will involve everything from helping clients to you know manage their trademark portfolios in Canada, as well as around the world. Um, that might help them enforce their brand, so sending cease and desist letters and sometimes suing people. And then I also help people um, uh, with, with their copyrighted work. So if they have created something, uh, we'll, I'll advise them on how to protect that. And then again, if, if need be, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll litigate to protect and enforce their, their copyright and works as well. So yeah, broadly speaking, I help people protect their brands and the things that they create. I love it. Just for, I love removing any misconceptions even the word copyright versus trademark break gives give us a little bit like let's go grassroots and let's build up from there (laughs) yeah absolutely so a trademark is any it's basically a sign that acts as a shortcut to getting a certain product a product so if you think about you know coca-cola for example coca-cola the word the logo um uh, the designs all those things are signs that when you're at a grocery store or you're at a convenience store you can use those things to get the product that you want. They're a shortcut to getting what you want. So a trademark is any sort of sign that uh, that you can use to basically get the things you want. Uh, Copyright, so that's a trademark. And And just just to be clear, does that that include the word mark? Like what's the element between like copywriting just the, the name of something versus the look? Like in our world, there's like, well, okay, we can trademark that name, but is it more complicated to go, I want to trademark this logo or the swoosh or some type of creative element, just the balance between the word itself on a page versus when you get into actually design and elements? Because what you talked about sounded fairly all encompassing. Yeah. So trademarks can basically be anything, again, like literally anything that um, uh, can act as that shortcut to a product. So the most common ones are obviously word marks, right? Then you get into design marks. But uh, under the new uh, regulations to the, or the new amendments to the copyright, or the Trademarks Act, sorry, that came out just a couple years ago, there's now the opportunity to actually seek registration for, uh, you know, modes of packaging, uh, scents, uh, uh, tastes, uh, colors, all these sorts of things, you know. Um, really so, thinking yeah, of the five, really thinking about the five senses and how that can all, <laughs> all play into your brand. Like that's right, anyone yeah. who's bought an Apple product, opening the box is part of the experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So modes of packaging. Uh, okay. uh, so a couple, the last couple of years, I've taught uh, part of the intro to, to intellectual property course at the university here at the law school. And one of my favorite uh, things is, you know, showing uh, the students sort of just different trademarks that have been registered. And, you know, uh, the Ferrero Rocher box is is registered as a trademark as a mode of packaging. So that's an example. The uh, the shape of the uh, USB key that you know we that comes with Apple products that's trademarked. So yeah, all those things that again are 
So sort of indi indicators of source uh, can be protected. And so, yeah, it's a very broad list. Obviously, wordmarks designs are the most popular, but uh, you can get pretty creative and uh, seek trademark protection for a bunch of different things. That's really, that's, that's, it's interesting how broad and how almost conceptual that has become versus like, well, it's the word or it's not. But if you think about it, if I'm a brand who's built equity in the way that I present myself, the, every inch of my experience, how easy it is for a competitor with maybe loose morals to then start to want to piggyback on some of that goodwill that you spent time and money and dollars and energy to create. So that's literally what you're protecting. Absolutely. And when, when I talk about, you know, sort of what part of my job is helping to enforce brands, that is exactly, you've just hit on exactly what we're getting at when we go to enforce brands. Because you're right, you know, after years of coming up with a cool design and a cool product and delivering and exceeding expectations, there's goodwill. You know, people want to buy that product again. They want to, and they find it through these little things, uh, whether it's, you know, the way you package your goods, the logo, the slogan, the design. And so, yeah, there's a, we see all sorts of things in the day-to-day -day here. And uh, yeah, it's very, very common for, yeah, uh, people sometimes uh, unintentionally, but often intentionally, to try to copy those little elements because they want to steer people from your product to theirs. Well, and it so proves out that, you know, it's so easy and oftentimes a conversation that you sometimes have in organizations where they're like, well, I've got a logo, so therefore I have a brand. But what I'm really hearing you say, which I resonate with is the brand is actually the complete experience the customer has with your product, your service, what it may be. And that can come in all those little nuances. So that branded experience is what you're protecting, not just to oversimplify and think of it as a logo on, on, a, on a page. Yeah. So um, one of the funny things with trademarks is, uh, you know, you can get a registration. We can talk about that later. Um, but after three years, it can be canceled and you can lose that registration if you're not using it. So one of the sort of, uh, I guess, sort of the slogans that we talk about in the trademark world is if you don't use it, you can lose it. And I think that sort of is an example of that point that you just made. And I would completely agree with it. It's one thing to have a logo, but that logo is, uh, it's, it's a tool to sort of help protect all those other things that you're doing. So it's certainly important, it's a part of it. But yeah, if you have the greatest design, but your product stinks or your service is terrible, it's not gonna be worth anything. But if you have you know, tons of years of uh, innovation, of meeting and exceeding clients' expectations, of, of building a great reputation, well, that logo is gonna be worth a lot because people know anytime I see that, I'm gonna be blown away by your products or your services. So uh, yeah, it's- uh, the, 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 you, the trust in the promise. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, right. pro the trust in the promise. Like we've made Absolutely. a promise to be this and you can trust it. And this word mark or this look or this thing that you see is a trigger for that whole, what that cascading sense of emotions or experience that comes afterwards. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Which sounds kind of fluffy <laughs> sometimes, right? And I love it because brand can be fluffy until you experience it. I guess love is fluffy to experience it. And you're like, oh, wow, that's the best feeling ever. Uh, uh, having a brand meeting its promise to you, there's really nothing better. It's why we, it's why we create loyalty. It's why we become connected to these brands. So Absolutely. an organ is thinking about your trademark and thinking about what are you doing to protect that? Because somebody falsely or intentionally might really want to farm that out to their own benefit. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, well, you know, uh, we were just, when we were off air here, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, you starting up the podcast, right? And I think you said uh, the date that we're recording this, you're at episode 400. Yep. That is 400 episodes of work that's gone in to build goodwill for your, mm -hmm. your podcast. And yeah, they're, you know, if someone's out there going, hey, I can steal some of uh, Tyler's listeners, you know. They're short. They're you know trying to get a shortcut to all that goodwill that you built up. So uh, yeah, that's exactly what uh, trademarks uh, and sort of the law around that seeks to protect. You know, okay. uh, yeah. I know we we camped out on trademark a little bit. Talk a little bit about copyright as well, just because again, words that get I think interchanged sometimes not accurately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so copyright is another one of these intellectual uh, sort of things within the intellectual property uh, sphere. Uh, the other main ones being patents. Uh, which protects inventions, mm -hmm. and then industrial designs, which sort of protects the shape and the designs of, of, of objects. But copyright is quite literally the right to copy. So, and it comes up mostly in, um, uh, often in the artistic world. So, um, you know, it protects, you know, say a painting, it can protect a photograph, and it sort of protects artistic works uh, where there has been, uh, there's originality, and there's been skill and care that's gone into creating it. And so, 
a lot of times our clients will come to us with, um, you know, sort of having issues where maybe um, parts of their catalogs have been stolen, where they have these beautiful shots of their, their um, you know, their products and someone else has just taken them. Uh, it could be artistic works that have been stolen. It could be, you know, manuals that they've written where there's copyright in that work because uh, it took a lot of work to put that together uh, and it's an original creation that's been stolen. And so, yeah, copyright sort of is, is uh, gives you as the owner of the copyright the right to stop other people from making and reproducing copies without your permission. And so, yeah, generally sort of artistic works or literary works or stuff like that, but uh, it's pretty broad as well. It can cover soft software uh, code as well. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of, again, a lot of uses for it to sort of help protect these these brands and these these uh, products and services that you, you might be selling. And to clarify, say I get a trademark, it's still up to me to police it. There is, I've heard someone say, well, once I get a trademark, there's like a trademark police that'll go around and manage that for me. I'm like, oh, I don't think so. I don't think that's how it works. Like this is still self-managed in, in that way, correct? Like there's, you're using the legal system, but there is no, no one else is out there looking out for that. Tra you, you, you spent money, you did the process, you spent, I think, which can take sometimes years to get a trademark in place. You still have to be the police for your own brand. Is that correct? Am I understanding that accurately? Yeah, so I would say, yeah, the short answer to that, that question is yes. Um, no one is going to be out there, uh, you know, scouring the internet or scouring store shelves uh, to see if there's infringement. So yeah, you have to do that. Uh, that being said, and we can, there's there's two types of trademarks out there. So, um, well, they're all the same trademarks, but there's two sort of uh, there's unregistered and registered rights. So let's okay. say, for example, you're in Calgary, you've 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 got a business going, you're um, you're. Uh, uh, maybe just for the sake of example, let's say you've got a cool name for a barbershop. So you got this great barbershop okay. that's going on and you've been working at it for five years and you built up a reputation in Calgary. By virtue of the fact that you've been operating there for a period of time, you've had sales, you've had some advertising, you will accrue, you've got a reputation. You know, you have goodwill in the, the name and the logo for your business. That's called common law rights. So mm -hmm. just by virtue of that fact, if someone comes into Calgary and, you know, opens up a, a, a sort of a similar business with a similar mark, you can uh, rely on those rights to, you know, send them a cease and desist letter or sue them if you need to, uh, to get them to stop. The issue, though, with those common law rights is the fact that they're only limited to the geographic area where you actually have a reputation. Yeah. So that's where this idea of getting registered rights comes in. So. To register those rights, what that owner of the barbershop would have to do is they'd file a trademark application with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, and it takes a couple years, um, but, you know, assuming they can get it, get it registered, once they get a trademark registration, they will have the exclusive use to that mark in association with the goods and services that they're using, so in this case a barbershop or salon services or something like that, from coast to coast even though they've never done any business outside of Because they took Calgary. the time and went yeah. through the process of registering it versus the common law, which is, yeah, you're using it, but it's only restricted to the jurisdiction where you might have some of that goodwill you talked about. Yeah. And so there will be a little bit of policing in that once you get on the register, so you file that application for your mark, if someone comes along and files a confusingly similar mark after you, what happens when you file your application is it's, it's examined uh, by the trademark examiners over in, uh, over in Gatineau there, uh, and, and they will look for compliance with the act. And so one of the things that they will examine your application for is say, hey, is this confusing with another mark that's already on the register? It, you'll, you'll get some protection there in that if it is, they'll raise an objection and they won't allow it to be registered. But that is the full extent of any okay. sort of monitoring that happens. And that's is, still going to be based on a category. Like, so for example, like we'll take that barbershop. Let's say their name was similar to somebody who wanted to register a mechanic shop. Yeah. Those would be yeah. different categories, correct? Like those Absolutely. both could get registered marks because they're relevant to different sectors and different business offerings, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about, you know, a confusing mark, again, all these things are defined under the act, but basically what you're looking at is uh, sort of a list of, an, of a handful of factors. You're looking at, you know, how similar are the marks themselves? Like, do they resemble each other in the sound and the words and the ideas that come out? What's the, what are the goods and services? Um, if, if the mark is totally different, you're probably out of luck. 
if the goods, the mark's similar, but again, they're in totally different fields where no one's going to be, you know, uh, confusing a barbershop for yeah, a mechanic yeah, shop. Just exactly. play with those, just play with those two. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're you're out of luck. And then it gets into, well, look, how long have you used it? Have you built up a reputation? But yeah, generally, uh, those two factors are, are key. And you're right. Um, it's pretty, you can sometimes get beyond those fields and say, well, look, this is a similar mark. Even though you're in a totally different field, I think there's confusion. But usually, yeah, uh, that's it's it's you're you're going to be protected for those goods and services, and it has to be similar or overlapping with uh, another business. So, could it be easily confused by the public yeah. or by someone from the outside? Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about even like, do you work a lot with startups early early stage? And we can get into like early stage can mean a couple different things. Also, do you, yeah, is that an area? Because I think that's. That's, a, that's an area that's ripe for challenge because you're growing, you're pivoting, you're not even sure if what you're doing today is going to be what you're exactly doing six months from now. So as as my legal counsel on the call here, as my as my de facto <laughs> expert, where, when and how and where do you recommend for someone in an early stage, and let's say it's a technology company, so they're building sure. some type yep. of, and their value comes from the fact that they've got something, a better version of a mousetrap, or they've got something different that's unique. When does a company like that need to start looking at this, maybe at the seed round or the angel phase where you know, they've got a thesis, but maybe they don't have product market fit yet. Like, do yeah. you trademark something that could change in six months? Do you wait? What's the advice you give? Well, I think uh, I think the, the general advice is you should, you know, as soon as possible, you should be th at least thinking about this, right? Um, because the last thing you want to do is get out there and start advertising um, a business and start, you know, trying to attract attention and then have to change your name, you know, six months later. Because Wham, you, you, get realize, that, you get that letter that some of yeah, us have seen yeah. over the years. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I like I don't think. Like, I think obviously you have to have an amazing product and service and you have to, you know, because if you don't have that, you've got... There has to be to a justification of why you would go through the effort, right? Yes. Um, but, you know, to, to get a trademark application on file, like, it, it's pretty cheap, you know, for... Uh, we do it for, you know, for a simple application. We can get it on file for around 1500 bucks, which is okay. less than that even, which is very affordable, right? To just it's good to remember, this isn't, this isn't a you decide tomorrow and you get it done. Like, this can take years, Absolutely. but you can do it. I've, I've been involved in these before or will you do a search and see if you're even in conflict? Okay, yep. well then let's figure out what categories we're going to be in. Okay, that's next that's step two. Yep. Now let's put in a basic application. So if anything happens, we can at least show we've got some tracker. You get kind of a date on the books, right? Of when you put this yep. put this out to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, no, I think it's uh, always great. And and yeah, we would we would tell clients. So if you're if you're a startup, we would say you know look, think about it right from the get go. Because again, you want to be careful. You know, you're not investing all this time and money marketing something that's just going to change overnight. Um, but yeah, we would recommend, you know, start looking around at the marketplace. So do some sort of a search, you know, for us, uh, we always tell clients, you know, we can check the trademarks register and do a knockout search for, you yeah. know, a few hundred bucks just to make sure there's no obvious obstacles that are going to get in the way of an application. But we can also do a comprehensive search where we're looking at what's on the register, what's online, what's, you know, going on out okay. there. What, what's, what are there trade names that could potentially be an issue? Um, because yeah, if you start a, if you start a, uh, you know, pick up a, a trade name or a, a trademark and it turns out that there's someone else who's, was before you, they will have rights, their rights will trump yours. And so, yeah, you always want to sort of think what, what about you, what you don't know can't hurt you is what I'm hearing. Exactly. Clear. Okay. And, and so, and then the other thing is, and then, you know, if, you know, assuming things are good, we'd say, yeah, get that application on file simply because it becomes sort of a, sort of a marker out there of saying your attempt to get inter, you know, national rights. And if someone comes along and goes, hey, I was at this conference of this company out there, they don't know what they're doing, they can't get in, they can't get on the register in front of you. And so, uh, yeah, we think it's always great to, uh, to think about it. You know, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, uh, forego your product development budget. Uh, but yeah, it's always good to think about it uh, at the beginning. Well, I think you touched on something. When, when I have minimal resources, it tends to all to go towards developing my product. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah. far be it to develop a product that then you can't. So what do you say to someone who, but, but Nathan, I registered my URL and I, and I, and I registered my company. I went to the Alberta registry. We'll just play the Alberta or even Canadian. I registered this as a national corporation. I didn't have any issues. So what do you mean? I have to now look at trademark as, as well. How do those differ? And how do like, I've heard that before. Well, I've got my URL, so I'm good. Right. I'm like, Ooh, no. And then the next one is I've incorporated under this name. Nobody told me anything there. I must be fine. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, a trade name registration or an incorporation uh, is not, um, or, or registering a domain is not going to give you like 
it's not going to give you sort of exclusive use to those things at all. Okay. Um, again, this comes back to sort of our conversation earlier about common law rights. Um, you know, just because you get a trade name uh, or just because you get a domain doesn't mean you're actually building up any reputation in those marks uh, that would form the basis of it or that you're building any reputation across Canada. So again, you come back to the barbershop idea, right? You might say, yeah. look, I have my Alberta corporation, I've got my little domain, but if all your sales and all your advertising is limited to that one area, there's nothing stopping someone in Toronto or someone in Newfoundland or someone in BC from using that exact same name for the exact same goods and services um, because you don't have any rights outside of Alberta. Um, and so that's why, uh, again, um, that's why we always tell people, you know, it's, it's good to think about getting this national registration because you're protecting yourself from coast to coast. Um, and you're, you're going to stop those sort of copycat people who might go, hey, you know, I was on vacation out there. I saw this amazing business. I want to bring that back here. <laughs> you know, that's where I've that had conversations with friends. I was somewhere on vacation. I saw this amazing concept. I want to do it. And, and by default, is it jurisdictionally uh, like Canada, US? Like is if you get a trademark, is it by default Canadian? You're not getting an Alberta trademark versus an Ontario trademark. It is national, correct? Yeah. So our, our system is, is national. And okay. um uh, what we tell a lot of clients as they're thinking about expanding is basically all these things we're talking about here are very similar in other jurisdictions around the world. Okay. There's all these treaties and stuff that sort of have, you know, there's wrinkles from country to country, but there's a lot of the same ideas. So if you're thinking of, hey, uh, you know, my, uh, my business is going to be expanding in the States. You know, we can connect you uh, and, and there's there's lawyers and trademark agents in the U.S. who do the exact same thing that we do here and they will run searches for you. They will help you register your rights to make sure that you're good to go and you're not saying, well, hey, great, we're really good in uh, in Canada, but then we launched in the States and we got that cease and desist letter. They can make sure you're you're good to go in uh in uh, in a lot of in a lot of jurisdictions as well. And actually, it's very common uh, for our larger clients. It's very common for us to get mandates where they say, look, we're thinking of launching a product in these jurisdictions, the, you know, all around the world, but these are our main jurisdictions. Yeah. We're actually want an opinion on, are we good to use that mark in Canada? And while we reach out to you, we're reaching out to council in the US, we're reaching out to council in Europe, we're reaching out into council in Mexico, and they're basically testing different brand names and different ideas in all these jurisdictions because for them, they're going to be launching all over the world it's going to be a ton of money to market this stuff. It's going to be a ton of money to get these products created. And they want to make sure that the risk of yeah, them running into any issues are, are low. So, um, so yeah, whether you're at sort of the start or at the end, all these same issues uh, apply. And, they're, and they're, they're things you want to think about. Um, I think the stakes are obviously higher, right, if you're one of these, these bigger companies because... Um, you know, if you're doing an international product, well, you've got more exposure. Yeah, you, you also yeah. have a bigger, you have a bigger target. Yeah. Is that also, is that a bit of a universal truth that, you know, larger companies tend to take stuff like this a little more seriously. They've got teams, they've got budget, they've got, it's a, it's a line item on their, on their go-to-market or their growth plans for a certain product where smaller companies it gets lost in the shuffle. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but to me, that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it, I think just with any larger organization, there's always, um, uh, I think there's just more, uh, because there's more people, they're, they're able to stay on top of more things, right? And so, yeah, a lot of the, the, yeah, the larger right. clients that we work with, they have in-house trademark counsel. So this is, you know, these issues are top of mind uh, for them, but they also have huge HR teams. They also have huge marketing departments, yeah, you know, it's so right, it's sort it's of, right. it's everything. But yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely more, just more sophistication and more awareness at, uh, at larger companies, which, for sure. Which makes sense. More sake. Yeah. Uh, we talked, Copyright, trademark, intellectual property. How does that, does, is that, it sometimes feels to me like it's a blanket term that captures stuff underneath or do I need to think about it differently? No, that's, that's exactly what it is. So yeah, generally uh, intellectual property is sort of, um, would, would sort of be the sort of the catch all for trademarks, for patents. So that's again, protecting inventions, okay. for copyright. Um, and then industrial designs, which sort of protects the shape of things. Um, you can also get into plant breeders, rights, But I know nothing about that, and I don't deal with it. Oh, um, when you get into genetics, yeah. genetics, and we own this versus you own that, and like, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's yeah. a whole. Yes, right. That's another. That's a different podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I'll get some. I'll get, right. some ag, I'll get some ag. I'll get some people on for that one. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. But no, I was just chatting with a, a 
uh, a guy the, uh, this past weekend who was saying he works for um, the government and they develop different plants. And he's a, he's, he works at the experimental farm here in Ottawa. And so he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're into plant breeders' rights. And so, yeah, that's part of IP, you know, protecting yeah, yeah. innovation and stuff. Uh, it's, all, it's all part of that. So let's do maybe a little story time because uh, you probably see elk. What's, you know, the most interesting thing you've seen trademarked, maybe the most interesting kind of like maybe battle you've seen, like share a few stories, war stories, because people, you know, it's fun to conceptualize this and understand it, but also to hear like, hey, I was involved in a case, obviously nameless, that this is kind of what came up and like nobody even realized it was going to be an issue until it was. Anything like that on your radar? Like you've got, you've got to have a few, a few stories from around the fire. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so yeah, there's been a lot of, <laughs> I'm sure there has, been a lot of <laughs> which stories. one do you pick? Which one do you pick? <laughs> um, I think, uh, so for example, one of the things we've seen a lot, uh, over the last couple years, um, is, uh, and, and actually there's, there's been some decisions on it as well. So I sort of seen it on a small scale, but it actually has gone to trial a couple times is, uh, people who will import knockoff goods. Uh, mm. from often from uh, you know different countries in uh, that are known for you know manufacturing goods yes. and stuff I, I think we might all know the names of some yeah. of those countries we and, don't need to get specific <laughs> and they will and they will um you know they'll just be selling them online and they they will get dinged you know so these big companies uh, two years ago was lululemon launched a big uh, lawsuit and won last year it was burberry and mm. you know they've gone after these people you know saying look we have built these amazing brands. What are you doing importing these cheap <laughs> knockoff stuffs and organizing these little live stream parties and these Facebook groups to sell them? Like, you can't just stick our logo on, a, a, you know, a really poorly made product yeah, and, and kind of don't get away we, with don't, that, right? And don't think we won't notice. <laughs> yeah, we notice. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, you'll see this, uh, it'll happen. Uh, there's tons of Amazon takedowns as well, where, you know, these very, these, just these knockoff companies are, are coming. So we see all that all the time. And I think a lot of the times you sort of look at this and you just go like, what were you thinking? Like, is it a little bit of like, just get away with it until I can't. And again, we're trying to get into the mind of someone who would do that, but it, it <laughs> Is there anywhere you think you're not doing something that's going to get you on somebody's radar? Or maybe you just think you're too small to get noticed. I don't, I don't know. I'm just rationalizing what you might be thinking <laughs> to do something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, I think it's sometimes, you know, I think it's, it, it's hard to paint everyone in the same brush. I think sometimes people yeah. legitimately just don't know. I think, yeah. uh, I think too, right? Like certain, um, we live in a very diverse country, right? And certain countries, um, don't necessarily um, no, that's very protect true. this that's as much, right? Yeah, so I think I if you're maybe coming from another country where it's not seen as being wrong, it's there's maybe an un, just an unawareness there. Um, but when, um, you, when you travel, I've bought the most beautiful watches for friends for fifty <laughs> bucks in Southeast yeah. Asia. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. the best part is when they go, "Oh, would you get that watch? I got it from Tyler." And they look at it. And it's like a twenty. It's a, tw it's a quote unquote twenty thousand dollar watch. But my buddy, being my buddy, just doesn't say anything. <laughs> He's like, oh, "Did you get that watch? I got it for Tyler. Wow, that's a good friend. Gives you a watch like that." He just, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah, Ty, I'm gonna have to plug forty my ears bucks for in this Tyler, whole... fifty bucks in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to plug my ears for this whole conversation. But uh, anyway, that yeah. was many years. I was younger. Okay, it was okay. many years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. It was a different well, time. Time destroyed. Yeah, but yeah. there's not a ch yeah. It, it, it definitely has a product that didn't last. Yeah. But you travel much around the world. It is plentiful opportunity to purchase whatever knockoff from almost anything you could you could imagine especially in that in a cash and carry style environment like yeah you're not, so buying, a, you're not buying a knockoff mercedes or bmw but you might buy a knockoff brewery or a knockoff coach or whatever not that yeah long. and so right rightly or wrongly i think sometimes there just isn't an awareness that hey in canada mm -hmm. these laws are enforced you know um yeah. but then yeah the other ones that have been funny actually have involved um uh, some copyright things you know we uh sometimes people will just not realize a license has expired or they won't realize they needed a license for something. And then they get this giant, you know, demand letter that comes in. Uh, I had one guy who had, um, uh, he had built some websites and uh, found out that, uh, and he was, he was in a sort of a small service industry kind of thing. And then he found out there was all these like other websites that were basically exactly like his. And he's like, what is going on there? Turned out they had all hired this developer who was just stealing his stuff. <laughs> so he's sort of like, Okay, that's and not, that is how, that's how that's it happens good. though. That you run into that stuff on a regular, especially in the marketing comms. Like, oh, I can spin up a website for for five hundred bucks because I'm just ripping off somebody else's. Website. Yeah, yeah. And so these six, you know, six, these six days, three, three companies with the same photo on uh, the same billboard photo that they got off stock that they all bought the rights to. But even that, how damaging that can be. Of like, I saw my logo on a dentist ad, but I was using it for a gym ad while someone else was using it for a healthcare brand. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. And that's so, not even infringement. That's sometimes even the, each company bought the right to that, but they thought they had the exclusive right to it, which is different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's lots, lots of stuff like that. And again, hmm. I think, uh, you know, I think for the most part, people are trying to run a good, you know, honest, honest business if there are these issues it's you know it's accidental um but yeah every once in a while there just are um there's uh you know bad intentions and uh, or just very differing opinions on where the line is right so uh, fair, uh, yeah, fair yeah. enough talk to me you talked about copyright you're talking talking about you know play, talk to me a little bit about ai and chat gpt it feels like that opens up a whole other bag of tricks of what is copyright and who wrote it and where did that come from and where did ChatGPT pull it from? And is that something that's starting to surface a lot more in kind of your conversations, your dialogue as technology just becomes more powerful? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things. So the federal court actually just uh, said they're not going to use AI in their decisions uh, because there have been some interesting cases where <laughs> I can't remember the details exactly, but someone submitted something that was done uh, with AI. And, you know, whenever we write legal arguments, we always say, well, look, this legal principle comes from this case. And so they had done this and it had come up with cases that didn't even exist. <laughs> so I've heard, yeah, I, I've heard yeah. some, I've heard some talk about that. Yeah. It's, it's citations were completely made up. Mm -hmm. Completely. Yeah. So like, that's not good. Um, yeah, <laughs> red flag, uh, red flag. Yeah. There's a number of, there's been a number of lawsuits. I don't think any of them have resolved yet, but in the States okay. where, um, yeah, the people who've written these original works uh, that have been fed into these AI machines have said, well, look, you never asked for our permission to, you know, to use this and is, sort of what you're creating a derivative work and is that then, you know, infringing on my copyright. So it'll be interesting to see where that, uh, how that shakes out. Um, and then, yeah, I think, um, you know, while AI, you know, can have some negative things, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, right? Like um, uh, some of the work, you know, I think there's, there's a real chance that some of the sort of more mundane stuff uh, mm -hmm. that every job has will be able to be done by some of these tools. So I know like we're, uh, as a firm, we're exploring a lot of these tools. You know, how can we use them? How can we obviously uh, maintain client confidentiality? How can we, right. but how can we leverage this to actually better serve our clients? So I think it's one of these things where, yeah, like it, in some ways it could be a little scary uh, and potentially infringing a ton of rights. But at the same time, it might allow us to actually really think um be able to just sort of spend less time on the mundane and really think strategically and give better advice to, to our clients. So I Which think has always cool been the promise well. of technology and sometimes it delivers on that and sometimes it just makes us busier. But that's, that's a bigger that's conversation. That's right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, if you go back and watch the Jetsons, we were all supposed to be working two hours a day and having technology do everything for us. I, I'm not sure who's <laughs> serving who, but that's a, that's a different <laughs> philosophical conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other can of worms. It <laughs> is. What advice would you give? And I recently had somebody on the show, there was an, inc there was an issue in Calgary recently where a small local uh, clothing manufacturer got into a tussle with a very large retailer, being Walmart in this case, where all of a sudden they spotted a very much of a trademarked and unique um, attribute or design that they had put out it in the on the shelves of one people had called them and said hey is this you are you and one they're like no that's not but this looks a hell of a lot like and so they kind of went to bat with them and you know there was a lot of people oh it's big you'll never get anywhere and they did get some traction so just thoughts and i'm not sure how it's all netted out but curious the advice you would give if somebody calls you up uh, who's a small business who maybe did the trademark or did the copyright process but they're up against a behemoth, somebody that just tweaked it a little bit, but it's pretty clear somebody somewhere, knowing or otherwise, borrowed a design or a look and feel that happened to be actually had been trademarked officially. Yeah, so I think if you ever, I think if there's one sort of takeaway I can leave your listeners with, it's there are a lot of tools. So we've talked about brands, you built your business. There's a lot of tools, whether it's trademarks, whether it's copyright, that you can rely on to protect your business. And so, you know, if you ever have a question, if you ever have one of these issues, call someone who lives and breathes it every day yeah, because they will tell you, let you know what your rights are and then they'll let you know what your options are, you know? Um, because yeah, a lot of these, um, like for example, um, a lot of these online platforms, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Amazon, they really want to protect, um, they have very good policies that protect brand owners and protect intellectual property rights because they want to show that these brand owners were trustworthy and if you have issues we'll protect you and okay. as a result you're gonna you're gonna advertise and you're gonna use our platform right so i think like in all these cases right um just because someone's big 
just because someone's small. The facts, most of the time, the case will turn on the facts and it'll turn on who has rights and who doesn't have rights. And so, yes, obviously it's expensive to litigate. Obviously, you know, sometimes people will throw around financial heft, but most of the time cases will, will turn on, on the facts and on who has rights. So I think in, in that situation, you know, if you are... Um, uh, you know, you, you think you see an, an infringing issue or, you know, even if it's a big person on the other side, just go speak to someone and find out what your rights are and what your options are. Uh, because size doesn't, um, it, it, that's not going to be the ter- the determining factor. Sure, it, you know, budgets plays a, a role in ultimately mm-hmm. what will happen. But, um, you know, if, if a big company is seen to be abusing sort of, you know, the little people's, in, you know, like they're the small startups. Yeah, yeah, uh, the David right? Goliath story, right? That yeah. does not look good for them either, right? Like no. they want to be seen, you know, a lot of like, so it's funny. I get all this a, a lot of times. They say, oh, well, you know, these big companies, they're just about the bottom, the bottom line. And it's like, well, every business cares about the bottom line. <laughs> but my experience is that these big companies, because there's risk, because there's reputational damage, they really, really care. And so if they are absolutely in the wrong, they will want to make it right. Because, you know, uh, if if there's a, a news story that gets picked up and goes around the world, there's a lot of reputational risk there. So, again, I would say talk to someone and don't worry about the size, you know, and the budgets and, what you know, the teams of lawyers who may or may not be behind it. Figure out what your rates are. And I think you'd be surprised if, if you have a good case. I think you'd be surprised at the results that you could get. I appreciate it. that's really good advice and like that social license to operate. I don't think companies have been ever held account to the level they are they are now. Just as back to social media, if someone's gets some bad press, whether it's an airline who threw your bag and you caught it on film, like we've all seen, like I'm just thinking of that one. Uh, like all of a sudden, like the public does not typically side with; they side against the big brand, and that can hurt them financially. To your point, like reputation does matter. Yep. And we have a world where we all have a miniature soapbox in our hand at all times, almost right, with yeah. social media to get it out there. Yep. With some of the cases that you see or some of the cover there's a lot of this get settled out like you know if there was 10 cases do do three go full the full distance do a couple do they get does this usually get resolved with some back and forth and I'm, I'm being careful with usual and percentages but like to your point of don't be scared to at least get into a conversation because it might actually get resolved faster than you think <laughs> yeah so i'd say two things there so number one um some of the hardest cases to settle that I find are where people are trying to do it on their own so let's say I have a client who uh you know gets a demand letter from someone um, if the person on the other side is doing it on their own, they usually don't actually know what the rights are. They don't know the law and they can be really, really difficult to actually come to a, a fair settlement because their idea of what's fair is just, it's not grounded in anything. It's not grounded in the law. It's not grounded. It's, in it's grounded in, be, in being slighted, which is a dangerous place to negotiate. From. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I'm, I'm offended that you're offended kind of mindset, right? <laughs> yeah. So Again, not to be a broken record here, but yeah. talk to someone because <laughs> even advice, if it's going to, yeah. even if it's, you know, it might cost you a bit of money. Well, first of all, most lawyers will actually get on the phone for 15, 30 minutes and say, tell me what's going on. And it's I, the I second think, 30 minutes that really caught. No, I'm just, the <laughs> yeah, that's, that's when the timer now. starts running. Yeah, no, but most likely <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll give you a sense, right? They'll give you yeah. a gut check and they'll say, look, if you want to move forward, here's what I think it'll cost based on however many years I've been doing it. Right. So you can usually, you know, get a sense or get a gut check without having to, you know, get at your credit card and whatever. Um, but yeah, so Normally, people will start off by sending demand letters. If there's an issue with infringement, they'll start off with sending demand letters. And I would say most of the time that settles. Even then, if you go the next step of starting a lawsuit, I think the stats are like 95% of cases settle before it actually gets to a trial. Oh, is, is that so the number? It's very, yeah. very high. And you know what? Uh, uh, we we also do some stuff with the trademark opposition board, so that's related to opposing sort of other trademark applications that you think might be confusing. Even those uh, administrative proceedings, most of them settle along the way. Uh, the courts and and the boards are very quick to encourage settlement. Um, they they recognize that um, you know there can be a lot of financial stress and uncertainty that comes with litigation, and um, a lot of times um, you know a lot of times there's a there's a better business way forward. You know, just, it, it can cost a lot of money to prove you were right. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's a dangerous, yeah. Is, whether is it, is getting that judgment? That could be a mar- that could be marital advice you just gave Nathan right there. Uh, that's right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or any kind of, proving yeah. you're right in any situation usually ends up costing you somewhere. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You know, and so, and so a lot of times what we'll do is when we're giving advice is we'll say, look, under the law, this is what we think you're, 
your position is. We think there's an X amount percent that you'll win, but look, it's also going to cost this much to, to, to prove you're right. Is that worth it? Or is there a compromise? Is there a, uh, just a better business decision that makes sense why you might want to settle it? So yeah, most things settle along the way. And uh, a lot of our work is advising, you know, in, in this contentious stuff, a lot of it is, is sort of spent in, uh, you know, coming to an agreement that works for both sides. Which makes sense. This is maybe a self-serving question, but I'll, like, for you maybe in terms of, I've had friends do this process or where they went to a lawyer that said, yeah, sure, I could do trademark, but it wasn't their area of expertise. But they're like, yeah, yeah, I can. How important is it? And I saw them spend a lot of money and I've had some experiences where I went with somebody, that's all they did. And it was so efficient. It was streamlined. They had a process. Like, How critical is it, in, especially in the world of law, to work with somebody who actually plays in the space versus like, sure, I'm a lawyer. I, I can do it versus the... the so, And I'm not trying to minimize or criticize anybody, but yeah. I guess for the audience, like, call somebody who this is what they actually do. Like, In your experience, I'm assuming you would back me that that's a good, that's a good first step. 100%. Yeah. So we'll think about it, right? Right? Like if you have, uh, if you're sick, right. And you've got a, a, you know, a very specialized surgery that needs to happen. You go to the specialized surgery. You don't <laughs> not the, go not the to GP, the family no GP. No criticism to the GP. Yeah. yeah you don't go to the family GP who's never operated on anyone in their life because it's all medicine, but it's very different. And the same thing good, I think good, totally good applies here. You know, I'll have people come up to me and say, Oh, Hey, you know, uh, got this issue with my neighbor. He's sort of building the fence too close to my yard. And I'll be like, I don't know. Is you there know? something about your fence that you can trademark? Then I don't know if we should have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, um, you get you get the backyard barbecue. So I, yeah, this problem. What do you? Th I'm like, I, dude, I'm not. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I'll take a look. It's kind of that joke, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, um, and to be fully yeah, honest, fair, like fair I love eighty percent of my time is spent on trademarks. Twenty percent of my time is spent on copyrights. That's all I do. Okay. And so I live and breathe this. You know, every single uh, every single day, and I've lived and breathed this every single day for five years. You know, so um, I think yeah. There's a there's a certain efficiency and a certain expertise that comes with that, and I in, in personally I think it's that's what you want to go to. You want to go to someone who knows the answer right away, has seen how these things play out. I, I think you'll get the best advice when you do that. And the same thing if people come to me with these sort of questions. One of the great things about working at a firm like Gowling's is we have 700 lawyers from coast to coast. So I would much rather you you, you might know somebody. <laughs> yeah, I know someone. You know, and I way rather like I don't want to take it. I don't want to get it wrong. You know, like, you know, we're talking about reputational risk a few minutes ago, right? I have a reputational risk. I want to make sure that everything I do is right, you know? Um, I, I and if that. I start diving into other areas where I'm, I'm not familiar with it, I, my confidence and my ability to get the, the answer right it goes down simply because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So, yeah, I would 100% recommend, um, you know, uh, going to someone who lives and breathes in these areas. And the same thing too, right? Like if you're... Um, if you've got an employment issue, find someone who, who lives and breathes that area of the law. You'll get a better answer and you'll get it faster and you'll get it cheaper uh, if you find an expert. And it goes for everything. Yeah, no, sol solid advice. N nuance, nuance matters, experience matters, and, yep. and subject matter expertise is critical, especially in a world where it feels very conceptual until the second it, it lands. And you're like, oh, okay, now I see where we're at. But I do really appreciate your kind of putting it out there as like, give me a call. Like, don't tell a story in your mind of it might be this or it might be that or I don't have a chance or, or whatever, or I've been slighted. Talk to somebody who can at least give you a kind of a view, sometimes maybe a ra more rational view outside. Because when you get close to it, you also get sometimes, we all get a little, as my friend says, wrapped around the, wrapped around the axle. He, said, he likes to say <laughs> when it's when it's personally when it's close to home and yeah. you build a company you build a brand an idea product a service like you should be connected to it you are you are going to be emotional and that's uh, as you should <laughs> absolutely yep yep uh nathan really appreciate the dialogue it's an area that constantly comes up in our space of you know hey did you, do you have right to this name or this product like oh, what do you mean trade we don't need that and it comes up all the time and i find that there's such a misnomer and where you've got that I don't know. Sometimes people, you know, we're all internet experts. You fill in your own blanks. And I think that can, that what you don't know can very much hurt you in this, in this space. Mm. Yeah. Um, best way to get a hold of you, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, what, what's your preferred? There's a million ways out there. What's your, what's your preference? Yeah. If you just search for me in Google, uh, my, uh, profile with Galling, uh, Gallings will come up. You can find me there, nice. send me an email, but yeah, I'm also on LinkedIn. Happy to connect there. And, uh, and yeah, like uh, as much as we're talking about saying, you know, give me a call. If any of your you know listeners have these sorts of issues, I'm happy to take that call and uh, or, or take that email and just have that initial conversation to see if, if we can help you out. Um, again, I uh, I uh, you know I 
before going into law, I was I've actually played in a band, you know, and so okay. when you're talking about these startups, like I have flashbacks to you know we're <laughs> trying to do our first album and do our first tour and okay, how wait we have to get a work permit to go in the states. So you know I totally resonate with all these stories about just not knowing and trying to figure stuff out. And uh, you know I still remember the first time reaching out to hire a lawyer and and you know just. You know, what's this going to be like? Uh, you know, I've heard it's going to be expensive. And uh, so, you know, as much as I spend a lot of time working with really big clients, I do work with a lot of small clients and I know exactly I what it's like to be there. So, you know, <laughs> I, felt, I felt the pain of the, the and the unknown is, is scary. And you've you're always dealing with limited resources, time, time and money and, and, and yeah. mind space. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to take the call or take that email just to sort of at least point people in the right direction. Right. Like even if it's not a fit, um, you know, it's I, I always enjoy you know, giving people a bit of information, pointing them in the right direction and, uh, and just knowing they're, they've, they've got, you know, that knowledge, you know, and they know, they know a bit more and they can make that much of a better decision for their business. So it's always fun to do that. I appreciate you putting that out to the world. So if people, if you're listening, people's audiences, take them up on it. Have, have a chat. <laughs> that first conversation that don't, don't push it. Don't kick that can down the road. Yeah, because don't be, it, don't it, be scared of it. I hope I've got, you know, like I, You've made I'm, it very approachable. Yeah, I'm a you've done a very guy, good job. Okay, you know, I, and I love what I do, so you know, I'm I'm happy to uh, to help people out. Right on, man. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for coming on, and thanks for sharing your the, the knowledge. I really, really appreciate it. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. 